Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. I love a little unsolved historical murder. Mm -hmm. They're fun. (laughs) Uh, They are. Uh, There's always fun speculation. That's how I got drawn into Charles Francis Hall's story. But it turns out his story is just so much more than that. One, because we don't actually even know if he was murdered. Uh, But also because he was a character with differing opinions of what he was like. Uh, He was definitely driven and determined very independent, and without any real experience, he started mounting expeditions to the Arctic. Uh, He was inspired by expeditions like Sir John Franklin's push to find the Northwest Passage, but unfortunately he repeated the pattern of doom when he made a try for the North Pole, although it wasn't a case where the entire expedition was lost. He was the only one from that expedition to die, And that has left historians with a mystery for the last 150 years. And we're going to talk about all of that today. Charles Francis Hall was born in 1821, either in Vermont or in Rochester, New Hampshire. Most accounts put Rochester as his birthplace, but his wife once mentioned in writing that he had really been born in Vermont, but the family moved to New Hampshire when he was still a baby. This kind of uncertainty is something that really dogs Hall's life story and ultimately his death. He didn't get a lot of formal education and became a blacksmith's apprentice at a young age. But he didn't stay with the blacksmith trade. He moved around a lot on his own from a fairly young age, but we don't know a lot about his early life. His story gets a little bit clearer in 1849 when he moved to Cincinnati, Ohio. And by that point, he was already married to a woman named Mary Ann, although we don't know a whole lot about her either. In Cincinnati, Hall started his own business, making seals and engraving plates. And then in the 1850s, Hall became a newspaper publisher, running the Cincinnati Occasional and the Daily Press. Because of his paper, Charles Francis Hall found a passion in reading about stories of exploration when they went to press. He became especially interested in the reports of Arctic exploration and efforts to find the Northwest Passage. Became especially interested in the stories of the 1845 Franklin Expedition, in which the entire team was lost, By 1857, Hall was collecting all the information he could about Arctic exploration and John Franklin's expedition, as well as others. Basically, anything that could be connected to any of these subjects. And he was lucky that there was a lot of news coverage of all this. The media ran a lot of stories around the 129 people who had died on Franklin's quest. And all of this reading inspired Hall to start exploring for himself. This was a very bold move. He didn't have any experience in such things. Everything he knew regarding the Arctic and exploring it, he had learned from reading about it. Listen, reading is fundamental and it's a great way to learn things, but there was no practical experience involved. But in all of his readings, he had come across rumors that there were survivors of the Franklin expedition, and he was determined that he was the guy who was going to find them. Bodies from the Franklin Expedition discovered in 1859 on King William Island uh, did not convince him. Hall believed there were still survivors and that he could find them. In 1860, Hall met with Henry Grinnell, the founder of the American Geographical and Statistical Society, who had given funds to previous Arctic expeditions. Grinnell helped Hall connect with various whaling companies so that he could arrange for the ships to take him as a passenger. On these whaling vessels, Hall traveled to Baffin Island and started a two-year exploration expedition of his own. Baffin Island is a 950-mile or 1,500-kilometer-long island in northern Canada, which sits across Baffin Bay from Greenland, It's massive, and Hall was hoping to find survivors of the Franklin expedition there, although that did not happen. He did find various artifacts from the much earlier travels through the area led by Martin Frobisher in the 1570s. Specifically, he found some evidence that Frobisher had tried to mine gold 
And for clarity, because I didn't put this in the outline, he wasn't just like wandering in the wilderness looking. He was following up on clues and meeting with indigenous peoples and stopping at forts and stuff and being like, do you think? And going on that information. But he really was uh, being incredibly brazen in all of this. Hall returned home in 1862 and wrote a book titled Arctic Researches and Life Among the Eskimo, being the narrative of an expedition in search of Sir John Franklin in the years 1860, 1861, and 1862. That was published in 1865. And he explains in the opening of the book that the day that he finished writing it, like literally as it's going to press, he was leaving for another expedition, having prepared by learning to live among the indigenous population of the area to get a fuller understanding than most explorers could. He wrote, quote, I enter upon this undertaking with lively hopes of success. I shall not, like previous explorers, set my foot on shore for a few days or weeks or, like others, journey among men whose language is to me unintelligible. I shall live for two or three years among the Eskimo and gain their confidence, and I have the advantage of understanding the language and of making all my wishes known to them. Obviously, the word Eskimo is outdated language, but we're including it in direct quotes rather than subbing it out. Yeah, it's also spelled in a way... It looks very French it and does fancy. Look incredibly French. <laughs> <laughs> um, those wishes were the same as on his earlier trip. He wanted to find survivors of the Franklin expedition. And this journey was more than twice as long as the first. It took five years. He started at Hudson Bay's north during his years long expedition of the area, making his base in Nowyat, which was referred to as Repulse Bay. He did learn a lot about Franklin's expedition and even found some of their belongings. Up to this point, he had believed rumors that some of the party had survived, but it appears that his finding of these relics, as well as listening to the accounts from the indigenous people of the area who had seen the Franklin group, this all led him to conclude that there had been no survivors after all. With Hall on that second trip were two interpreters that are usually described as Inuit. They are called Joe and Hannah. So their real names are a little bit tricky because they are written in different ways at different times and they're transliterated by English speakers. Uh, the the most common ones look like, and I'm not even going to claim that I have this pronunciation, uh, Eprkvik and Tukalito. Uh, Tukaluto is the wife who was like the interpreter and and really um, kind of helped facilitate with people that were not speakers of their language. And she uh, has been listed by a lot of other names, so it's very unclear how she got this particular name. But I think all of this comes down to why people started calling them Joe and Hannah or why they started asking people to. They had been on other expeditions and had helped other people. But they lived with Hall in the U.S. after he returned from his first expedition. So they had spent two years with him. And they were surely part of why he felt so confident in his preface to his book, stating that he understood indigenous culture and that he knew that he could live among the people of the Arctic. Again, all of the white people who were exploring into this territory were doing so through the labor of indigenous people who were acting as their, like, their guides and their interpreters and all of that. So, like, regardless of his own feeling about this, like, they were the ones that were doing a lot of the yeah, work. He, he could not could not have lived among... No. The indigenous people, had they not been with him, if he just showed up and said, I'm going to live with you and learn all your stuff, it no. would not have worked. Uh, there was a troubling incident on Hall's second expedition, which gives some insight into his personality and behavior. He had not been able to get funds to finance his own ship for the voyage, so he had hitched rides with whaling vessels. He also sometimes made contracts with whaling vessels to borrow men from their crews. Several years into the second expedition, in the autumn of 1867, he did just that. By March, he and the borrowed crew, as well as his guides, were back at Repulse Bay for the summer. During the spring, Hall became convinced that some of the whalers were undermining him and even verging on mutiny. He shot one of the men, Patrick Coleman, who then died a very slow death over the course of two weeks. 
Hall's journal from this period does not mention this. There's just a gap of several weeks in the journal. But his account of the expedition, which was published after his death, does mention it. It is unclear where the information in this published account, which is quite detailed, came from. Yeah, there has even been some speculation that an editor pieced things together and that it's not actually Hall's account. Uh, But we don't know. When Hall returned to the U.S., he had to answer for the shooting, theoretically. Uh, But it actually got tangled up in red tape. So at that time, the area that Hall had been exploring was not part of Canada. So the British and Canadian governments did not want to get involved with the incident. And the U.S. didn't seem to think that it had any reason to get involved in something so far away from its jurisdiction. So Hall was never charged, although it doesn't appear that there was also ever any mutiny afoot. So it seems like he really had this irrational thought that he acted on and killed a man, and nothing was ever done in terms of consequences. We don't know if Patrick Coleman ever actually did anything to provoke Hall or if Hall just perceived that he had. But this whole incident really evidences a dark side of Charles Hall, who was described by some people as volatile and obsessed with the Franklin expedition. He had called finding the survivors or evidence of what had happened to them his mission. We'll talk about Hall's next plan after his second expedition after we pause for a quick sponsor break. After returning home and accepting that everyone from the Franklin expedition had died, Hall's explorer impulse was not diminished in the least. He had merely shifted focus to reaching the North Pole himself, This is something that uh, some accounts suggest he started really thinking seriously about during that second expedition. Charles Francis Hall's earlier efforts had gained him a little bit of attention and notoriety, and he managed to get President Ulysses S. Grant and a number of congressmen interested in his North Pole plan. He wanted to run a full expedition himself with his own ship and not have to depend on making deals with whaling ships to travel. And in 1870, Hall got his financing. The U.S. Congress granted him $50,000, which was quite a lot of money, to mount an expedition to the North Pole. The undertaking was under the jurisdiction of the U.S. Navy and the National Academy of Sciences. And this was the first Arctic expedition that the U.S. government fully funded. Hall was given command of a ship named the Polaris for the journey, This had been a steamer used by the Union in the U.S. Civil War. It was given a makeover and reinforced so that it could withstand the cold of the Arctic. Although he may not have wanted to work through the whaling industry for travel anymore, Charles Hall hired a captain from the whaling industry who he had sailed with on his two prior expeditions to Captain the Polaris. That was Sidney Buddington. On June 29th, 1871, the Polaris left New York City for Connecticut and then set sail from New London, Connecticut on July 3rd, 1871. The Polaris next stopped in Greenland to pick up supplies, sled dogs, and guides. And once it was fully outfitted with its crew, the USS Polaris had 33 people aboard. Eight of these are once again described as Eskimo in accounts of the day. Two were the Inuit couple that he had already been friends with and had been using as guides and also their son. There was also another indigenous couple and their kids. There were four children in total on this expedition, three little girls, ages 10, 8, and 3, and the boy was six years old. Later, there was a fifth child because one of the couples had a baby during the expedition, which was a boy who they named Polaris. In addition to Buddington, the ship had a doctor, Emil Bessels, and an astronomer named R.D.W. Bryan. There was also a meteorologist named Friedrich Meyer. Emil Bessels, in particular, is important to the story. He was only 24 when the Polaris expedition began, but he was already very accomplished. He had graduated from medical school at 18 in Heidelberg, Germany, where he was born in 1847. And the Polaris was not his first Arctic expedition. He had visited the island of Spitsbergen on a previous undertaking. As kind of a fun side note, the archipelago, which was called Spitsbergen, is now Svalbard, where the Svalbard Global Seed Vault is. 
the island itself is still called Spitsbergen. Back to Bessels, he had also served as a field surgeon in the Franco-Prussian War, so he had a lot of life under his belt before he ever stepped onto the Polaris. The leader of his prior Arctic expedition, a Dr. Peterman, gave Bessels the highest praise and endorsement. Initially, this trip seemed to go very well. Hall and his party got farther north than any non-Indigenous people had, reaching 82 degrees, 29 minutes north latitude. That was the farthest a ship had gone that was recorded in, in Western history. But the situation on the ship was not as great as those auspicious beginnings might have suggested. It appears that Charles Hall was in conflict with two key members of the team. Buddington, who many people said he was friends with, and Emile Bessels. In October, the Polaris and its crew prepared for a long winter stuck in the ice. They had come up against ice as they approached the Lincoln Sea, and they found a harbor on the northern shore of Greenland that Hall dubbed Thank God Harbor. In early October, Hall set out from the ship on a sledge to do some exploring. When Hall returned from his scouting trip after two weeks on October 24th, he sought the comfort of a warm cup of coffee. And after he drank it, he became sick, very sick. He experienced painful symptoms, including partial paralysis and dementia, and Bessels initially took care of him, believing he had a stroke. Bessels recorded in his notes that Hall got slowly better the next day and that they gave him, quote, warm mustard foot baths and cold compresses placed on his head and neck. And as he started to recover, Hall also started talking about going on another sledge trip. And he also wanted to know if the crew had been following his instructions to prepare the ship for winter. But Hall fell into what Bessel said was delirium and then became suspicious that someone on the ship was trying to kill him. He thought that he had been poisoned, and he said so many times. And eventually, he didn't want anyone to help him. He died on November 8, 1871, and he was buried in a shallow grave on Greenland's shore. Bessels wrote in his notes his account of the final days of Charles Hall, noting his diagnosis that he had a stroke, and then probably a second stroke after he had overexerted himself in a moment of feeling better. Bessels described how very difficult it was for the men to dig a grave in the hard ground, and that it had taken all night for several men to dig a hole just two feet deep. Hall's death left Buddington in charge. Initially, once the ice had cleared, efforts were made to go on with the mission, but the ship was having leakage issues and the weather wasn't cooperating. Once again, the Polaris was stuck in the ice in August of 1872, and it stayed there, drifting along with the ice field with no power to steer, In October, as things grew uncertain as to whether the ship could survive the shifting ice and the pressure on it, Buddington told the crew that they needed to move everything overboard along with the smaller boats. Many members of the crew and the guides and their families were off the ship on the ice when a gap suddenly formed and the Polaris and the people outside of it who were on an ice floe were separated The Polaris was at the mercy of the wind and currents when it pulled away from the spot where it had lodged in the ice, and it vanished, leaving the crew on the ice floe with really little hope. Yeah, they thought the Polaris was lost. The 19 people who were on the ice stayed on that ice floe with no means of controlling it as it floated around for more than six months. Finally, on April 30th, 1873, after almost two harrowing years at sea and 196 days of that were spent on an ice floe, the floating survivors were rescued when a sealing ship known as the Tigris happened upon them. All of them survived, which seems miraculous, but we really have to note that it's truly because their Inuit guides had taken care of everyone. They were fishing and hunting from the floe's edge to keep everyone fed. And according to the account of Dr. Bessels, who was on the Polaris when the ship and the ice floe were separated, when the ice floe survivors later saw the Polaris at shore as they had been rescued and were brought to land, some of them had initially wondered why the rest of the crew had not come to their rescue, because from that vantage point, it looked like the ship was okay, but it actually was not. It had several structural issues. Parts of it at that point were missing, and it just could not have done so. Although the group on the ice floe had believed the Polaris to be lost, again, it was not. 
Buddington had run it aground close to Etta Greenland after he and the crew had furiously worked to keep it together just long enough to get to land. Buddington and the remaining crew wintered near Cairn Point. When spring arrived, a whaling vessel from Scotland named the Ravenscraig rescued the Polaris crew in Melville Bay, where they had traveled in small rudimentary boats that they made from pieces of the Polaris. Buddington made it to Washington, D.C. with the remaining crew. That's another instance where we need to um, note that they also survived because Inuit, who were living in that area where they went aground, took care of them. They did not survive on their own. Uh, There was a Navy Board of Inquiry mounted in June 1873 to investigate what had happened to Charles Francis Hall. Although some of the people from the ice flow testified that Hall was adamant that he had been poisoned and that there was no accounting for who had touched Hall's coffee before it reached him, Hall's death was ruled as the result of an apoplectic seizure, which is another name for a stroke. The official report stated that, quote, from personal examination of all the witnesses and from their testimony as given, we reached the unanimous conclusion that the death of Captain Hall resulted naturally from disease, without fault on the part of anyone. Not everyone shared that opinion, and we'll talk about one of the people who gave his opinion on the matter to the press in 1873 after we pause for a sponsor break. were, in 1873, some suspicions about what had actually happened to Hall and whether he had met with foul play. On Sunday, September 23, 1873, the New York Herald ran the headline, The Story of the Ice, and featured a very lengthy write-up of everything that had happened to the Polaris team. And it opened with a statement from Dr. Bessels that reads, quote, We are much surprised to find from the American papers that several rumors of mischievous tendency, which I must characterize as silly and absurd, have been put into circulation concerning the expedition, and particularly concerning the death of Captain Hall. It is just possible that the government at Washington would prefer that we reserve what we have to say for a graver occasion, but we must emphatically contradict the statement that Captain Hall died any other than a natural death. He died of apoplexy. He was ill about a fortnight. He appeared in perfect health when entering the voyage. I noticed nothing unusual in his health up to the period of his illness. The rumors that he was poisoned are too absurd to be seriously entertained. The rumor may have been founded on the hallucinations of the raving patient. So, Dr. Bessels thought that the deceased Charles Hall started a rumor that he was poisoned. And that rumor was definitely swirling. And in that same article, there was a damning statement from Inspector H. Clarip Smith. He was the man in charge of the government storehouse at Greenland, where the Polaris stocked up, and he had some thoughts about the vibe of the group. He told the Herald's reporter his concerns about what might have happened to Hall. According to the write-up, Smith was not surprised when he heard that Hall had died. He told the Herald, quote, I pitied him from the bottom of my heart. To me, he imparted the source of all his troubles, and a more distracted man I have seldom seen. My house was open to all the officers of the expedition, and I had, of course, every opportunity to learn both sides of the story. When Smith was questioned about the group dynamics in play among the officers on the voyage, he told the reporter, quote, Buddington was only an instrument in the hands of a third party. It was not long before I discovered a very bitter feeling existed on the Polaris, and although Buddington was ostensibly the cause of the quarrel, that there was in the background a far more dangerous element to contend against. As Smith's statement continues, it sounds like conflict began over whether scientific work should take precedence over the objective of reaching the pole. He said, quote, As far as I could learn, no trouble manifested itself until the coast of Greenland was reached. Now, it was pretty well understood that Captain Hall was not a scientific or highly educated man, though perfectly competent to command such an expedition that was entrusted to him. Dr. Emil Bessels was chief of the scientific corps, and Mr. Frederick Myers, the meteorologist, and to these gentlemen, Captain Hall looked for assistance in carrying out the great object of the expedition. 
From what I heard, however, he was disappointed in the direction. And although Captain Hall, fully realizing the importance of all scientific discoveries, was anxious to afford them every facility, he was nevertheless bound to maintain his own right as commander of the expedition. Captain Hall told me in a despondent tone that both Bessels and Meyer carried on their operations without regard to his authority. For instance, when Hall requested Meyer to take an observation, he refused to do so on the ground that he was responsible only to the government for his actions. Smith also stated that he thought Bessels was using Meyer as his mouthpiece. Smith's concerns about Bessels did not stop there. He also told the reporter that Bessels knew that as doctor, he was indispensable to the crew and that if he left the expedition at any time it was at port, many of the men would have joined him. He also noted that in writing letters about the expedition to German journals, Bessels called it the Hall-Bessels Expedition. And he noted that while Hall wanted absolutely no alcohol on board, Bessels got a stock of it under the auspices of medical supplies, and that he believed Buddington, who had been reported as having been drunk on a number of occasions on the trip, must have gotten it from the doctor. According to Smith, the meteorologist Myers was openly insubordinate, so much so that another Navy captain, Captain Davenport, got involved while they were docked in Greenland to settle the matter, but that after that, there were a lot of bad feelings toward Hall. Yeah, Hall had wanted to put Myers in shackles and uh, keep him on board, apparently, to do the meteorological work, but like sort of in a captive state, so naturally... Not a lot of loving feelings towards that. Uh, But we should note, this is all the account of a third party. But then Smith recounted an argument that he had witnessed between Hall and Bessels in his own house. And after that argument, Hall gave Smith and his wife four boxes of papers for safekeeping, which he said involved information about the Franklin expedition, which he was not comfortable taking on the trip. He had packed it initially, but then offloaded it in Greenland. These papers involved information about members of the Franklin expedition resorting to cannibalism, and he did not want them made public while Franklin's widow was alive. And Hall seemed to think that if he brought those papers on the expedition, they would be lost forever because something might happen to them. Then the really damning statement from Smith came out, quote, I cannot help thinking that despite the testimony taken at Washington, his death was not the result of natural causes. Everything induces to that opinion, for undue influence had been exercised over the crew to lessen their respect for her commander, and the jealousy of some of Hall's subordinates taking in connection with the whole affair leads me to the conclusion that there was foul play. I think the body of Captain Hall, which I have no doubt is still in a state of preservation, should be sought after and exhumed. Bessels never fully outran these accusations in the court of public opinion. Kind of any time something happened where he was written up in the paper, it was like, and suspect of the murder of Captain Hall. Uh, But nothing further was done regarding the death of Hall once the Navy Board had made its decision. Bessels went on to work at the Smithsonian Institution, and he published Scientific Results of the United States Arctic Expedition and other papers about the work that he had done on the journey. He died at the age of 40 after a stroke. It wasn't until almost 100 years after the expedition that questions arose once again about what exactly happened to Charles Francis Hall. In the 1960s, Dartmouth professor and Arctic historian Chauncey C. Loomis started researching the expedition for his book, Weird and Tragic Shores, the story of Charles Francis Hall, and Loomis wanted the body exhumed. That happened in 1968. Loomis himself went to Greenland for the exhumation, and an autopsy was performed on the well-preserved body. Toronto's Center of Forensic Sciences ran neutron activation tests on samples of hair and fingernails that were collected. This revealed some very interesting information and was even the basis for a paper that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1970 titled An Inquest on the Death of Charles Francis Hall. Charles Francis Hall had been given arsenic in the last two weeks of his life, and a lot of it. Suddenly, Emil Bressels was once again looking suspicious, as there was arsenic in his medical kit. Remember, at this time in history, it was used to treat all kinds of things, like joint problems and syphilis and dry skin. 
But the doses Hall was given were far beyond what would have ever been administered for any medical reason. But even though there had been conflict between the two men, it just didn't seem enough to drive someone to murder, especially in a scenario where a limited number of people are depending on each other for survival. Additionally, Hall had his own medical kit, so it is possible that he may have overdosed accidentally when he was refusing medical help from Brussels, and he may have been self-medicating. So this mystery percolated on for another four decades, until another piece of circumstantial evidence was found, and that was an envelope. That envelope was from Charles Hall to a young woman named Vinnie Ream. It was postmarked October 1871. That envelope was discovered by Rhode Island College professor Russell Potter, and Vinnie Ream was connected to Bessels romantically and maybe also to Charles Hall. Reem was a well-known sculptor, and Hall kept a small bust of Abraham Lincoln she had given him in his quarters on the Polaris. She could potentially be an upcoming episode. Yeah, odds are good, is what I'm going to say. Because she's very interesting on her own, outside of any connection to these two men. So the idea that perhaps there was a jealousy between these two men might lend more gravity to the idea that Bessels was angry enough at Hall to kill him. For example, if he suddenly saw a work of art by his sweetheart in the captain's quarters, that may have prompted a jealous rage, but that is pure speculation. We will never, ever know what really happened and how Hall came to have so much arsenic in his system. But on the official record, Emile Bessels remains clear of any wrongdoing. The mystery forever. Yeah. Uh, do you have listener mail for us? Yes. This listener mail comes with a um, a note as to um, how to ensure that I obsess over your email and possibly read it on the air. This is the key ingredient you can include to make sure that I lose my mind. Okay, this is from our listener, Kelsey, who writes, Hi, Ollie and Tracy. I was just listening to your recent episode about Harrison Dyer while eating breakfast and enjoying learning about his drama and his tunnels when Tracy described the truck falling into the street near 1512 23rd Street Northwest, and I almost dropped my spoon. That's about three blocks from my apartment in the DuPont Circle neighborhood in D.C. It's kitty corner from my local coffee shop, and I have passed by there dozens of times. I had no idea there were tunnels under my neighborhood. Proof that history is all around. Well, perhaps obviously in D.C. Thank you for continuing to fill my days with fascinating history that I wouldn't have learned otherwise. Best wishes, Kelsey. And then Kelsey includes not her own cats, but her friend Astrid's cats, Crumble and Waffle, who she considers her nephews. And here is what you can do if you want to ensure that I lose my mind over your email. These two cats look like Devon Rexes, which no. is my very, very favorite flavor of kitty um, and was the, the breed of my beloved Mr. Burns, who has left this earth and is no longer pulling people's pants down or turning on stoves. But uh, <laughs> they are absolutely gorgeous. I'm obsessed and I want to kiss their faces. So um, Kelsey and uh, Astrid and Crumble and Waffle, Thank you for making me smile because this is some cute business. Mm. Those giant eyes and those giant ears. I love a little crazy Rexy baby. Um, If you would like to write to us and send us, really any cat pictures are good. As I've said before, any animals or pictures are good. Send me your tarantulas, your snakes, and your corvids. Send me your, I don't know, worms. Do people keep earthworms as pets? Probably. Ants, ant farm, I'm into it. I love all of it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, send me all of it. Uh, if you would like to do so and talk about maybe place, ways that our stories have intersected with your neighborhood, uh, you can do so at historypodcast at iheartradio.com. You can also find us on social media as Mist in History, and you can subscribe to the podcast on the iHeartRadio app or anywhere you listen to your favorite shows. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.